This is a special presentation of Farm Journal Television. You're watching Corn College TV. I'm Clinton Griffiths. Class is in session. Today on Corn College TV, standing up as the pest boss, stopping cutworms before they eat into profits, plus identifying crown roots on young corn and the role they play when an early season stand turns ugly. And we're going back to the planter for the pros and cons of starter fertilizer and the importance of proper down pressure on row cleaners. That's today on Corn College TV. Thanks for watching Corn College TV. All right, the crop's in the ground, the corn's starting to come up. You wake up for coffee and look out your window, and it looks like big chunks of your field have gotten a haircut. Today, Missy Bauer becomes our pest boss as we go scouting for cutworms. The importance of the pest boss this time of the year is to have someone on your farm that's in, in charge of making sure that things are being scouted and looked at on a timely basis. So that pest boss, early in the season, one thing we recommend doing is some moth uh, traps. What we do is put these moth traps out, looking for certain uh, moth flights, stick a small pheromone in them, which will attract one. This one, for example, that we're gonna talk about today is black cutworm. So these black cutworm moth traps go out uh, early in the spring, uh, depending on your area, uh, but as soon as things start to warm up. We'll put these out and then just monitor on an on a every couple day basis what kind of moth flights we're getting in these traps. And based on that, once we see a peak moth flight occur, we're gonna go ahead and start tracking the heat units. A lot of insects are very heat unit based. So black cutworm in particular, uh, we start monitoring uh, those heat units. Then when it becomes time to actually a scout out in the field, we'll head out to the field and be looking for certain things. The fields that we usually scout first are the ones that we know had a lot of weed pressure in early. So for example, this field had a lot of chickweed in it early. That gave a place for the moths to fly into and lay, lay their eggs. This was very attractive when they were flying through here. Once they, they've done that, we get out here from a scouting perspective now. As we're walking through the fields and doing our stand counts, we're gonna look for plants that start to have this wilted look to them or have actually been totally cut off. Uh, this is done by the black cutworm itself. So when you see a plant like this, we wanna investigate a little bit more and just start to scrape the soil back uh, as we try to look for the larva itself. So as you can see, this plant here has been totally cut off and we'd just go ahead and kind of pick through the soil here and see if we can find any of the larva in here. The larva themselves uh, will vary in size depending on the time of the year. I'll get a selection here of some kind of medium to larger sized ones that we found in this particular field. Once you're doing your scouting, as far as looking for the amount of plants that are damaged uh, or cut off, that threshold is only three to five percent in most states. So if you're getting that three to five percent cut, plus you're finding the actual larva themselves and identifying the stage on these larvae, that'll give us a good indication to how much longer they'll be feeding out here. So if we get to that threshold, then we'd go ahead and pull the trigger and spray this field. So this is a pretty important and very, very timely thing that we do need to be scouting for uh, out in our fields early in the season. Here are some more examples of what we look for in the field when we're scouting for the black cutworm damage. You can see this particular plant here has been cut off a while ago because he's actually started to regrow. So that still gives us an indication that he was cut, but he's actually started that regrowth process. So that's happened a little bit earlier. Here's an example of one that's been cut very recently because the plant's just starting to wilt, but you can see that he actually has cut this uh, basically totally off. So it's different than our first example we had showed where we could see the plant was still attached, but it was wilting. This one's actually been cut off totally. Here's another example, and we see this happen a lot out in the field. After they cut the plants, a lot of times they'll pull some of that green tissue down into the soil. During the day, they, they like to sit down in the soil where it's cooler, and then they'll feed on these plants that they have cut. So it's very common to find them down in here. So once you see some evidence of like this, of the damage, you want to go ahead and try to do some digging here where, where you look underground and see if we can find the actual larva itself.
And there he is. We'll often find them that they will be hid underneath that soil during the day like this. Um, at maximum size, these will get about two inches long. So you can see this is a pretty big, good size larva, but he's got a little bit more growing. And as they get large like this, they can really do a lot of damage in a short amount of time. So once again, check your state for that threshold. In a lot of areas, it's only three to 5% of cut or damaged plants and we need to be spraying. Up next, we're IDing crown roots on young corn and later solving problems before planting after a bad tillage run in the fall. Plus, we're answering your questions about when a good crop goes bad, the ugly corn period, when Corn College TV returns. Think about the way you farm. The Enlist Weed Control System is a proud supporter of this program and forward-thinking growers everywhere. You don't just see a farm. You see a common bond. That's what we're working to protect. Enlist is a new herbicide tolerant trait system that will build on glyphosate. Improving performance to move farming ahead. Hi, this is Mark Gold with Top Third Ag Marketing. I have just issued a free workbook on marketing in the top third. This book contains all the major principles from my marketing seminars. And top third wants you to try an option at our expense. Included in the book is a coupon good for up to $150 in premium, plus we'll pay the commission and fees. We want you to learn how options can help you become a better marketer. Call 877-TT-HEDGE or visit topthird.com for details. Some people tend to dream small. Others dream big. But with agriculture's ability to feed the one billion hungry people on the planet and a projected global population of nine billion by the year 2050, it's time to dream huge. Farmers Feeding the World is about agriculture coming together to increase both hunger solutions and food production. Learn more. Give generously. Please dream huge with us. Rust is destroying your valuable equipment and property. Rust Guy permanently stops rust the easy way. No scraping, grinding, or sandblasting. Brush, spray, or roll Rust Guy onto any rusted metal and it will not rust again. Rust Guy is not a paint, but an industrial strength formula that permanently stops rust. It leaves a slick, rock hard finish that can be left as is or painted. Rust Guy protects from salt, manure, fertilizer, urine, and rain. Call 888 Rust Guy to talk to a rust expert or go to rustguy.com. Today in the field, we want to identify the crown roots on young corn. So the crown roots become very important uh, for this corn crop as it takes up a lot of water and nutrients for the plant. So a lot of times we talk about the crown roots being kind of the yield power or the yielding roots of this plant. So it's important to understand how these crown roots are developed, being able to identify them, and then as we get later in the year, try to identify whether or not they're growing down at their natural 35 to 40 degree angle or if they're being turned. So on small corn, these crown roots are definitely already coming out. The best way to try to identify things is looking down the center of the plant here, try to find where the seed is, and then go ahead and that seed is attached to what we call the mesocotyl. At the end of the mesocotyl, it's attached to the crown of the plant. So the, I go ahead and I snap that mesocotyl off. You can see the seed and the seed roots. So we kind of get that out of our way. These seed roots are very important in the early stages of this plant. It'll live off these seed roots as well as what's in the seed until it gets to about this V4 stage. And then it starts to make this transition over to living off these crown roots or nodal roots. So we go ahead and take that out of there again. Look back down in the center of here where all these roots are coming out of is, this, is the base of the crown. So the first roots that come out of here are what we call our first set of crown roots. So I'm holding right here are part of that first set. We call them a set because there's typically about three or four of them going around the base of this crown. After that, the second set starts to come out. So these roots here are part of that second set of crown roots. And you can see that there's about four of them around this plant. After that, we'll see that the third set will start to come out. So on this plant, this is a V4 plant where we can see that we've just started to put our third set of crown roots out.
So as the plant develops and gets older, we get more of these crown roots coming out. For example, here was a V1 plant where we could see that the crown roots were just getting started to come out on that first set. Here on a V2 plant, we actually have all of this first set is out. So as these plants develop, more of these roots come out, we're going to typically have three to four sets of these crown roots. Once we know how to identify them, as we get later in the season, we want to see how well these are growing uh, down through the soil. They should be going at that 35 to 40 degree angle, and if they're not, if we see a lot of them coming down and turning like we have in this example here, that tells us that we had something restricting that. Uh, so we want to look at identifying that as the season progresses. When we come back, Missy Bauer takes your questions on why good corn may get ugly early in the season. And later, the pros and cons of starter fertilizer, plus finding the proper down pressure for row cleaners. When Corn College TV continues. Get harder working leaves and higher performing crops from your foliar application with Ratchet, with LCO promoter technology for corn and soybeans. Potential for great profits and big losses comes at a time of unprecedented market volatility. If you need help managing risk on your farm, turn to a source you can trust. Turn to Bob Utterbeck. In the business since 1981, Bob works with producers, feed buyers, and speculators all across the country, and he and his staff want to work with you. Call Utterback Marketing Services today to learn how you can build a plan to achieve your marketing objectives for 2011 and beyond. The secret to finding more buyers for your cattle is no longer a secret. CattleExchange.com is like no other site. It brings the greater ease of use, detailed information, and searchability found in sites like Cars.com and Autotrader.com to the cattle industry. Upload photos and video to attract more buyers and share greater detail in your listing. Cattle buyers and sellers are connecting in ways they never imagined. Go to www.Cattle-Exchange.com and discover the secret to better selling. Confusion, doubt, fear, forces that drive the markets in unpredictable ways. It would be nice to find a voice you trust, a broker with an impeccable compliance record, someone with global contacts and expertise, a sought-after speaker who simply tells it like it is. All that with 30 years of experience navigating these markets. Someone like that would be quite a find. Bauer Trading. Experience at work for you. Farmers Feeding the World is about agriculture coming together to increase both hunger solutions and food production. It's right there, between can and do. Learn more. Give generously. Dream huge. It's time now for our weekly question from the audience in our segment, Ask the Agronomist. Today our viewers want to know about ugly corn. The question is, my corn is in the V4, V5 stage. Things were looking great, then all of a sudden, it started looking horrible. What's going on? As our corn starts to get into that V4, V5 growth stage, we start to get a lot of phone calls. And they say, you know, I went by my field, it looks real good, and then all of a sudden they go by it the next day and it starts to look, well, kind of ugly. We call this the ugly corn syndrome period. What's happening is these plants are changing from the root systems of living off this seed and these seed roots to actually living off these crown roots here. If we don't have a good establishment of our crown roots as this plant makes that transition over, it's gonna look ugly for a little while. If we've got nice, healthy crown roots, it's gonna make that transition and you're never gonna notice it. An example of what we had here is a plant that really wasn't very established as far as its crown roots as it's starting to make that transition. This is a four collar plant, as is this one, but there's a huge difference in the growth of these plants as well as the crown roots themselves. So in this example, we have an, a restriction on the crown roots themselves that they're not growing very well that we can see down here as well. 
We dug up this plants and in this particular strip in the field, we've got some serious d soil density layers and com compaction issues out here. So we can see that we've got things that are restricting this crown root development. They're actually coming in and growing sideways instead of growing down. So when we're making this transition to them, we're not in very good shape and it's gonna go through this ugly corn syndrome period. Again, if we've got healthy roots, good crown roots, when it makes that transition like we have back here behind us, we won't really see the effect out in the field. And now we know. Earlier I caught up with Missy for a quick conversation on getting this crop off to a good start, but is it worth the cost? The pros and cons of starter fertilizer. Missy, one of the things that we debate a lot when we begin uh, the planting season is whether or not we should use a starter fertilizer. Uh, tell us what we need to know about that. Well, we think that starter fertilizer is very important. There's a lot of advantages from starter fertilizer. A lot of times we'll see that we'll get that early growth response from using it, as we see in this example here, where we've got starter fertilizer on this plant and we don't have any starter on this plant. Oh, right. So sometimes we can see some really big advantages in that early growth. It will be environment-based. How cool is it? How wet is it? The bigger response that we're going to get to this starter fertilizer. Okay, now what about disadvantages? Are, are there any? Certainly there are some disadvantages to starter fertilizer. The biggest thing is probably just trying to do it on the planter, trying to carry the starter itself, trying to have the attachments on the planter to be able to get it uh, placed properly. So there's a lot of uh, people that struggle, especially as the planters get bigger, uh, to try to keep the fertilizer, starter fertilizer on the planter. Now what about maturity of the plant? It's got to help it take off and grow faster. That's correct. Like you can see here, you know, in these two plants where we have starter versus no starter, it's already got an advantage in maturity. This is a V4 plant, this is a V3 plant. So it's already got that advanced in maturity. And we'll see this advancement in maturity continue all the way along. We'll see that this tassels on this plant will come out maybe five to seven days earlier than what we have on this plant. So we do see an advancement in maturity, which at the end of the year means drier corn. So we do see a lot of advantages of that as well. Okay. Um, so what else do we need to know as we go through uh, trying to make this decision? Well, one of the things that we get a lot of questions about are from people that have high soil test levels of phosphorus. So phosphorus is part of that starter fertilizer we're looking at. They say, well, I've already got a lot of phosphorus in my soil. Do I really need to put any more on? Right. But what we find with phosphorus is that it's just not very available early in the season. So when it's cool and when, it, when it's wet out, we don't get good phosphorus availability. So we can have very high levels in our soil but we can't get it into this plant. Okay. So having a little bit of starter fertilizer on there is important. So some of the components that we look at with starter fertilizer is gonna be nitrogen mm -hmm. and phosphorus. Of course, phosphorus being you know one of the most important things. And then also we look at zinc. So okay. those are the three main things that we say should be in our starter. And then you can always look at other options as far as potassium or sulfur. Still to come, running the right down pressure can pay off all season long. Ken Ferry gives us a few tips on what to look for. You don't just see a field. You see the future of your operation. One we're helping you protect. Enlist is a new herbicide tolerant trait system that will build on glyphosate. Improving performance to move farming ahead. Hello, I'm Mike Flores, and I want to help educate you to become a more successful trader. Open an account at Flores Trading, and you will have access to PFG's free library of online tutorials, which explain how to use futures and options, as well as trading methods you can employ. At Flores Trading, you always receive free live quotes 24 hours a day, and you can trade the markets right on your own computer. You can open an account online in five minutes with no paperwork. To get started, just call the number below. Rust is destroying your valuable equipment and property. Rust Guy permanently stops rust the easy way. No scraping, grinding, or sandblasting. Brush, spray, or roll Rust Guy onto any rusted metal and it will not rust again. 
Rust Guy is not a paint, but an industrial strength formula that permanently stops rust. It leaves a slick, rock hard finish that can be left as is or painted. Rust Guy protects from salt, manure, fertilizer, urine, and rain. Call 888 Rust Guy to talk to a rust expert or go to rustguy.com. The secret to finding more buyers for your cattle is no longer a secret. CattleExchange.com is like no other site. It brings the greater ease of use, detailed information, and searchability found in sites like Cars.com and Autotrader.com to the cattle industry. Upload photos and video to attract more buyers and share greater detail in your listing. Cattle buyers and sellers are connecting in ways they never imagined. Go to www.Cattle-Exchange.com and discover the secret to better selling. Kenner Row Cleaners can have a big impact on what the seed bed ends up looking like after we've run a planter through here. Talk to us about what we've seen in, the, in these two passes here. Well, what we're looking at here is a function of down pressure actually and what that does to the row cleaner. So in this case, the, uh, this row has what we call the right amount of down pressure. I don't want to move a lot of the soil and these are tougher conditions we're planting in today. So I want to keep the dry soil on top and plant into the moist soil below. This row, we're doing the same thing. <coughs> this row, we're doing the same thing, but we've increased the down pressure on the row unit beyond where it needs to be. And that puts uh, downward pressure on the row cleaner, makes the row cleaner aggressive as well. We can tell that here by the amount of soil that we're moving. So the row cleaner is moving that good soil that we wanted to stay on top of so we could plant into the wetter soil down below. So if we compare the amount of soil movement on this row right. compared to here, this is what, again, we call making the planter dance for us. So we want to stay on top of the dry soil and put our seed in below. So if I look at the amount of down pressure that was used here, I can, I can see that the footprint of the planter is clear, but I can still poke my finger into it. It's pretty loose right. and we maintain depth. We get over here, we can realize that I can see the row cleaner working here, but this ground is pretty firm. It's I, been pushed pretty I hard. I did okay. that with my planter. You know, we get out here in front of the planter and we're digging, it's nice and mellow, and behind the planter we got these hard heels. We're doing that with the planter. We're actually putting in compaction with the planter that's going to work against us through the whole growing season because we got to grow a whole root system through here. Right. We're over here, I took the down pressure off, and oh, these, yeah. these plants are going to come through that in good shape. So I am changing the micro environment to some extent. The other big issue is I pushed my dry soil away and I forced myself to plant into this wet stuff. So actual seed bed in here. It's going to be a rougher seed bed environment. I'm down in here in this wet soil. That, mm -hmm. that it's probably will, easier to smear the sidewalls. Right. I'm down in here in this wet soil and I'm smearing the sidewall with my planter. So if I'm going to look at the furrow, we're going to find uh, the planter slot. And we can dig these up and actually look at what the micro environment looks like around the seed that we're working with. But I can tell you, we, we, we really up the ante, and this is a very common thing that I run into. Okay. Too aggressive with the down pressure and with the row cleaner itself. Even floating row cleaners, if I'm carrying lots of down pressure, will get sometimes too aggressive mm -hmm. in these marginal situations. If the soil's all right down in here, not a big deal, but if you're trying to stay above it and put your seed into that moisture, you've got to be careful not to move it out of the way. Okay. But uh, then we can, we can look inside the micro environment that we've set up here and, and look at the difference that it's going to get for each seed. Missy Bauer and Margie Fisher continue our conversation on the agronomics of equipment with tips on spring tillage after a bad run in the fall. Missy, when it comes to around spring and we realize that we just didn't get our fall tillage done properly, where do we go from here? Well, we see this happen occasionally that uh, something happened in the fall and maybe the operator at that time wasn't paying enough attention. We see where we had ran our shanks here in the fall. We didn't get full shatter in between, so we end up with this column in here in between. So if our normal program was to come in here with a vertical tillage leveling tool to knock this off and plant, I would have con some concerns about that because a lot of times we're going to be having the planter bounce over here or plants trying to grow into where the soil is very firm in these columns versus loose here. So if we get out to the field in the spring, getting ready to do our leveling pass, we identify that this has happened, we're going to need to make an adjustment. And what I would recommend here is that we would actually look at going back maybe to a horizontal uh, tillage pass instead of a vertical one to get this leveled up because I want to try to protect the seed bed. 
So what we can see on this other side of the pit where we've actually done this is we've ran a sole finisher to get this leveled up here. Um, although it's going to still put in one of these density layers that we've talked about sure. several times, at least now I know I've got a good seed bed to be able to actually plant into. Okay, and how would you define this as, as a good seed bed? From the, from the point of view that we don't have these columns like we did on this side that came all the way up, so as my planter rides through here, my planter's going to ride through here uniformly. It's not going to be bouncing. So when it comes to things like uniform planting depth and setting my down pressure and even the spacing in the plants itself uh, from from how it's coming out of the seed tubes, we're going to see a lot more uniformity here. So this is going to lead to a good solid ear count. And I would take this good solid ear count, even though I know I got it on a density layer, versus over here where we would have a real poor ear count. So it all has to come back to my ear count. Sure. Thank you, Missy. All right, good stuff. Well, thanks for watching Corn College TV. Remember, you can always find these shows online at farmjournalcorncollege.com. And here's what's coming up next week on the program. Coming up next week on Corn College TV, we're back in the field looking to run the right tillage tool for our operation, plus some tips on vertical tillage and finding the right tools for corn on corn. We'll also see how a tillage system can impact disease pressure later in the growing season. That's next week on Corn College TV. We'll see you then. Class dismissed.